from South Carolina Public Radio. This is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on February 3rd, 2023. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. This episode features an introductory look at former Governor Nikki Haley's planned presidential bid, which she'll formally announce on February 15th. We catch up on statehouse activity, including the school voucher and certificate of need repeal bills that passed the Senate this week, as well as the fentanyl trafficking bill that passed the House. We hear from Senator Tim Scott on policing reform in light of the tragic killing of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, and much more. Also, interest rates are up and unemployment remains low, which means data. Data! The lead loves hearing from everyone. We love our listeners, from the people in power to the people that hold the power, which is y'all. That's why we want to hear what's on your mind, your hot takes, unpopular or popular opinions. We want to hear it all. 803-563-7169. Leave us your name, where you're calling from, and what's going on. Good vibes only. <laughs> gonna, gonna stipulate, good vibes only, guys. 803-563-7169. She's running. That's right. Former governor and United States ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, will be announcing her 2024 presidential bid in Charleston on February 15th. Haley has been preparing for this moment since she first became governor in 2010, and it's only built over the years as she's been a rising star in the Republican Party. Twice elected governor, became Trump's pick to represent the United States at the UN, a Trump favor to Governor Henry McMaster, who was the first statewide elected official in the nation to endorse him and helped him ascend from lieutenant governor to governor in 2017. So we will be on the ground in Charleston when Haley announces her run, and we'll have dedicated episodes coming your way on her bid. SCETV, South Carolina Public Radio, and The Lead is dedicated to bring you comprehensive coverage of the run-up to South Carolina's 2024 presidential primary, both here and with occasional reporting of our homegrown candidate or candidates? Question mark? Exclamation point? Confused face emoji? In the early voting states of Iowa and New Hampshire. Folks, 2024 is here, so strap in. Now, I spoke with friend of the pod, AP national politics reporter Meg Kennard, about Haley's upcoming announcement and how she got to this point, since Haley previously said she wouldn't run for president if former President Donald Trump jumped in the race, which he did in November. Trump recently said, quote, I talked to her for a little while. I said, look, you know, go by your heart if you want to run. That was Trump talking to Nikki Haley there. Now, here's Meg Kennard with more from This Week in South Carolina. Back in April of 2021, I asked Governor Haley, if Donald Trump is in this race in 2024, are you in or are you out? And at that point, she said she would not run against him for the nomination. Clearly, now, staring down this impending announcement of her own, things have changed. Um, When she's been asked about this in the past, and and I will say I have tried to ask her directly about what has changed and her campaign or her folks have not taken me up on that request. But when others have been able to ask her where she is on this, she has pointed to what she sees as a need for new generational leadership on behalf of the nation and specifically within the Republican Party. There's been a lot of discussion about President Joe Biden's age. But when it comes to former President Donald Trump, who is just a few years younger than the current president, Governor Haley is saying, look, we need to be talking about not necessarily somebody who's almost 80 years old being president again. And for her part, the former governor is 51. So she definitely would represent a new generation in terms of leadership. So that's one thing she talks about. But also, I think part of what she's been navigating is a lot of what has changed um, in people's perceptions of the former president. When she spoke those words to me back in April of 2021, that was kind of in a time of a lot of assessment of the former president's time in office right on the heels of January 6th and kind of what that meant. But, you know, among his base, among his biggest supporters, there was still a lot of support for the former president. And at that stage, at least when she was talking to me, Governor Haley said, you know, if he's in, I will still support him. Um, Now here, almost a year and a half later, 
a lot of uh, a lot of decisions have been made clearly on her part. But also there is a question as to how much of that electoral base of former President Donald Trump is really there to support him in another race. So she's weighing that calculus. And at least to her part, seems that she's decided this is the right time for her to get in. And now she'll be the only other person in the race with him at the same time. So uh, really two different candidates, two different approaches. Uh, what's she going to have to do at this point to kind of, I guess, differentiate herself from Trump, who seems to always take the oxygen out of the room, out of a race, uh, especially, you know, when they're so different and he has such an advantage when it comes to name recognition and just, you know, early polling that shows him in a strong lead? That's something the former president is very quick to point toward. All these polls, they show me ahead and I'm in great shape, so I'm not worried about anything. Um, But, you know, also when we're thinking about what this campaign is going to look like, whoever were to get into it right after Donald Trump, whether it were Nikki Haley or another candidate, that person in that at least temporary head to head matchup could potentially be on the receiving end of a bit of brunt force. I don't mean that in a physical way, but just in terms of rhetoric and politics and opposition. The former president is known to be a very serious campaigner. Um, We've been through campaigns in the past where a lot of his opponents have gotten nicknames from him. um, And at these big rallies, those are things that got a lot of rise out of his supporters who were there. And yes, it's just words, but still, you know, when you're out there as another candidate trying to make your best argument to the American people, um, that's just probably not something that you want to be the only person who's perhaps, you know, on the receiving end. So she has to be ready to deal with that. For her part, Governor Haley has been consistent, saying over and over, I've never lost an election. I'm not going to start now. And if I get into this, which she clearly is now, um, I'm going to put a thousand percent in it and finish it. Those are what we would expect to hear from campaigns, at least in the beginning. But this is kind of the optimistic time frame where there's still a lot of money to be raised. There's still a lot of supporters to garner. And, you know, it's kind of like when you start watching a football game and nobody scored yet, but there's just a whole realm of possibilities out there on the field. That's kind of where we are at the beginning of this campaign. And at least for her part, Governor Haley may very well be that only person who's another option aside from Donald Trump, at least for a little bit, because she won't be alone for long. Exactly. And of course, she can also command some headlines based on what head to head fights might be coming her way with the former president, too. So. That could also boost her messaging, getting her name out there more, and fundraising as well. So a lot to be watching in these formative days of the trail. But I want to ask you also about Senator Tim Scott. He's launching his Faith in America listening tour the day after Haley's announcement this month, and he'll be in Iowa a week later. Uh, Will we have two prominent South Carolinians in the 2024 race? A lot of signs seem to point to yes. Um, Tim Scott made it very clear that the 2022 midterm election to his most recent Senate term would be his last Senate campaign. He never said it would be his last campaign. Tim Scott has for years been setting up the sort of national type framework that oftentimes precedes presidential campaigns, setting up a nonprofit, setting up an associated PAC, visiting other early voting states like Iowa and New Hampshire. We're not alone on this early primary calendar. There are other states that play pivotal roles where he might be lesser known. And Tim Scott has been going there, as has Governor Haley and several others in the potential field. But he's been building that ground game. He's been laying the framework for what is very likely to be another 2024 presidential campaign from a prominent South Carolinian. So that means a lot of voters here are certainly going to have to kind of figure out which one they like better or if they like another candidate who may be in the race now or in the future. Some decisions to be made for sure and not to mention also competition for staffers who know this state well who are experienced when it comes to navigating South Carolina politics and also potential donors, because ideologically speaking, there's a lot of similarities between Tim Scott and Nikki Haley that a lot of folks are going to have to figure out if they like one better than the other. You can catch that full interview on youtube.com slash South Carolina ETV. Now, in the State House this week, the Senate passed its school voucher bill, S-39, That would create a pilot program that would provide for up to $6,000 in tuition and expenses for 5,000 vouchers for students whose household incomes are 200% the federal poverty level. Now, in the second year of this program, there would be a set-aside of 10,000 vouchers for households making 300% the federal poverty level. 
and the third year would allow for 15,000 vouchers for households making 400% of the poverty level. So that's another way to broaden this to more middle-class students instead of just those lower-income kids. Now, Democrats oppose this bill because they said it's a slow creep to private schools taking funding for public schools. The Senate passed the bill 28 to 15 on Tuesday along party lines. Senators then moved on to debate the repeal of the Certificate of Need bill for the rest of the week. Senator Wes Clymer's bill, S-164, centers around the regulation of medical facilities like hospitals and standalone surgery centers in the state. Doctors and Republicans say the current Certificate of Need situation is anti-competitive and favors powerful hospital systems which, along with DHEC, have approval power over, say, a group of doctors from forming their own surgery center. Republicans say that states that have repealed the CON regulation have seen lower costs and greater competition in the medical industry. The bill passed the Senate 30 to 6 on Thursday. Now, a similar bill passed the Senate in January 2022, but it died in the House. A bill outlawing the Carolina squad, S-363, is getting close to a vote in the Senate. I'm salivating on this one. (laughs) The bill would prohibit the front fender from being four inches or higher than the rear fender. Now, again, this doesn't count if you put something in the bed of your pickup truck. It matters if your suspension is changed. So, like we've been saying, squat them if you got them. The lead does not endorse (laughs) And the Senate Corrections and Penology Committee passed out the Shield Law Bill, S-120. Now, it won't guarantee that they'll be able to purchase or carry out lethal injections in the state, but Republicans see this as the best option to carry out the death penalty, as current death penalty law, which gives inmates on death row the choice of electrocution or firing squad, is being contested in the courts. The state Supreme Court asked for more clarity and information from the Department of Corrections and their ability to obtain such drugs. The bill passed out of committee to the Senate floor along party lines. And again, this expands the shield of anonymity to companies that supply lethal injection drugs to the state, which hasn't happened since 2012. Now, over in the House, lawmakers passed their fentanyl trafficking bill, H-3503. However, it differed from the one that moved out of judiciary and what we reported on Tuesday. Mandatory minimum sentences for possession charges were added into the bill, similar to what is in the Senate bill currently on their calendar. Now, this was done by a voice vote on the House floor, and it was not recorded. But the bill now states that possessing 4 grams or more of fentanyl or 4 grams or more of any mixture containing fentanyl is guilty of felony fentanyl trafficking. Now, 4 to 14 grams would result in a 10 to 25-year sentence and a $50,000 fine. A second or subsequent offense would be a mandatory minimum of 25 years and a $100,000 fine. Now, possession and trafficking of 14 to 28 grams would be a mandatory 25 years and $200,000, and 28 grams or more would be 25 to 40 years in the same fine. Again, these are the penalties in H-3503 for a new felony fentanyl trafficking statute. House Speaker Pro Tem Tommy Pope told reporters after the vote that tough action needs to be taken to crack down on the widespread problem afflicting the state and country. We do want to make intelligent decisions, but we also want to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball in what we were talking about. That's why I went back through the statutes and talked about possession, talked about knowingly, talked about possession with intent. And so this is the top level. This is not a kid with a pill. This is 40 pills, 60 pills, 80 pills, 100. This is significant weight of probably the most dangerous chemical we've seen. House Minority Leader Todd Rutherford criticized Republicans for not addressing some of the causes of the deaths associated with fentanyl. He and 20 other Democrats voted against 3503, expressing concerns around the mandatory minimums and the form of fentanyl. Judges have no discretion. The the biggest issue is I'm game for anything. Most of the body is if you give me the data and the evidence-based practice that suggests that it works. What, again, we deal with is a bumper sticker that says we did mandatory minimums. We can't prove that it works, but it sounds real good. What is the data suggesting? The data from Pew Research and others that looked at mandatory minimums said they simply didn't work, that the punishment is not a deterrent. What we know is a deterrent, grabbing drug dealers, those people that have powdered fentanyl, those people that buy pill presses, those people that have the binder, that is not included in this bill. That would have gone a long way towards stopping it. That's not bumper sticker politics, that's reality. A bill addressing fentanyl homicide, S-1, is on the Senate calendar. Moving up to Washington, Senator Tim Scott took to the Senate floor for his 10th speech on federal-level police reforms in eight years, this time following the horrific killing of Tyree Nichols at the hands of Memphis police officers. The speech came a day after Senator Dick Durbin was on ABC's This Week, where he called upon Senator Scott and Cory Booker 
to return to the negotiating table on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act after talks imploded in September 2021. At the time, Scott accused Booker and Democrats of pushing to defund police. However, the Fraternal Order of Police backed up Booker in saying that the bill would have provided more money for training and data collection and no one was planning to defund police, something President Joe Biden does not support. Now, some federal funding for local departments was contingent upon those agencies adopting measures like banning no-knock warrants and chokeholds, maintaining disciplinary records for officers, and racial bias training. But that was something even Republicans had proposed. However, Democrats also insisted that misconduct data include the complainant's race. Here's Senator Scott from the Senate floor on January 30th. We as a nation deserve better. We should be able to build a coalition around the common ground of, yes, we need more training on de-escalation. Yes, we need more resources and training on the duty to intervene. Yes, we need more grants. And yes, we need the best wearing the badge. We should have simple legislation that we can agree upon, that has been agreed upon in the past. But too often, too many are too concerned with who gets the credit. Tyree Nichols' mother, Rovon Wells, called upon lawmakers to enact change during her son's funeral on February 1st. I promise you the only thing that's keeping me going is the fact that I really truly believe my son was sitting here on an assignment from God. And I guess now his assignment is done and he's been taken home. I, I just need Whatever that George Floyd bill we needed passed. Yeah. Yes. Because there should be no other child that should suffer the way my son and all the other parents here have lost their children. We need to get that bill passed. Amen. And because if we don't, that blood, the next child that dies, that blood is going to be on their hands. Yeah. And going back to Senator Scott, he has been named to five committees for the 118th Congress, including the Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, on which he'll serve as the ranking member. He also sits on the committees of Foreign Relations, Finance, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, and a special committee on aging. Senator Lindsey Graham will remain the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, on which he has previously served as chairman. He also sits on the Appropriations, Budget, and Environment and Public Works Committees. Interest rates, well, they're up again, folks, after continued action this week in the fight against inflation. That's right, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee this week voted to increase interest rates by another quarter percentage point. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell told reporters on Wednesday that more still needs to be done when it comes to combating inflation. That has been falling, though, since generational highs last summer. At the December meeting, we all wrote down our our best estimates of, of what we thought the ultimate level would be, and that's obviously back in December, and the median for that was between five and five and a quarter percent. At the March meeting, we're going to update those assessments. We did not update them today. We did, however, continue to say that we believe ongoing rate hikes will be appropriate to attain a a sufficiently restrictive stance of policy to bring inflation back down to 2 percent. We think we've covered a lot of ground, and financial conditions have certainly tightened. Uh, And I would say we still think there's work to do there. We haven't made a decision on, on exactly where that will be. I think, you know, we're going to be looking carefully at the incoming data between now and the March meeting and then the May meeting. I, I, uh, I don't feel a lot of certainty about uh, where, that, where that will be. It could certainly be higher than we're writing down right now. If we come to the view that we need to write down, to, you know, to, to move rates up beyond what we said in December, we would certainly do that. At the same time, if the data come in in the other direction, then we'll, you know, we'll make data-dependent decisions at coming meetings, of course. 
The FOMC boosted the federal funds rate by an expected 0.25 percent, bringing rates to 4.5 to 4.75 percent. That's the highest since October 2007, according to CNBC. Data. The FOMC also characterized economic growth as moderate, especially with a low unemployment rate. Speaking of unemployment, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that the American economy added 517,000 jobs in the month of January and that the unemployment rate ticked down to 3.4 percent. That's the lowest rate since May of 1969, the summer of love. (laughs) U.S. Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh said in a statement that, quote, growth was widespread across industries with notable gains in restaurants and bars, retail stores, healthcare facilities, professional and business offices, and construction. We saw jobs added in the care economy that make it possible for more people to work, and labor force participation increased among workers between the ages of 25 and 54. Again, that was Labor Secretary Marty Walsh there in a statement. Now, the unemployment rate for black workers dropped to a near all-time low, although at 5.4%, it remains higher than the overall rate and indicates an important area of focus for economic equity policies. That's Marty Walsh there in that statement. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news, and we're glad that you're here. This is our chance to talk about things that, you know, a little break from the news, like I said, not not anything news related. It's news adjacent. I didn't introduce you yet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you think you can just talk without <laughs> me introducing <laughs> you? <laughs> Folks, I'd say T Shire. Get to give him a T Shire. Oh, thank, okay. you. thank you. Thank you. It's too much. It's our producer. It's too much. It's too resident much. snack uh, hater. Yeah, I like <laughs> snacks, just not the snacks that everyone else likes, okay? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Funyuns? I don't know if I've ever had a Funyun. I, I, you know, I'm gonna, I don't really care for the Funyuns. It's just not satisfying enough to me. I'm it's a big bizarre. onion guy, yeah. okay? And you carry one around with you at all times. I have them in my pocket, in my, in my socks. The man smells like onions, <laughs> but in a good way. It's good. A lot of people are talking about it in a good way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've heard a lot of people talking <laughs> about it. There's a lot of chatter on the onions. <laughs> anyway, Gavin, speaking of chatter... We got so we got chatter. We got call chatter. 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 Ooh, chatter later. Chatter, chatter. chatter now. Chatter, chatter. Okay. So are you ready, Bubby? Yeah, let's chatter it up. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> hey, Gavin and AT. This is David Ladner from Anderson, South Carolina. I have been planning to call you guys for a long time, and I'll get to that in a minute. But right now, AT, congratulations on your birds going to the Super Bowl. Super cool for you. I don't really care, but. I care because you care. And I got to tell you guys about combos. You have illuminated me. When you first started talking about combos, I thought you were talking about, like, getting a pizza and a drink and a side at at the gas station. But, no, you were talking about the bags of combo snacks. And when I finally figured that out after, you know, the third or fourth episode that you guys mentioned it, I decided to go to the drugstore. And I didn't realize you could get these things at the drugstore either. But I bought some. I tasted them. They were pretty nasty. But now I know. And so you've illuminated me. So thank you for that. I just got back from washing my filthy hands because of the combos. And, you know, that's another phrase I've heard from you, Gavin. So appreciate that. But I've been wanting to call for about a year because – I was listening to your March 15th, 2022 episode when Chandler Bailey called, and it warmed my heart because Chandler was one of my students in the environmental engineering program at Clemson, and it was great to hear that he's an upstanding citizen calling into the lead. Anyone who's calling into the lead has to be regarded as a quality individual, a participant in society. So great great to hear Chandler calling in, and he was headed to the South Carolina Environmental Conference, and it's coming up again this year, March 12th to 15th, 2023. So if you guys are not doing anything that week, you know, head over to the South Carolina Environmental Conference. And I want to repeat Chandler's shout-out to all the people in water and wastewater infrastructure. I think a lot of people are waiting for um, the ARPA money to filter on down, and so they can do lots of new infrastructure projects. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen there. And this is getting a little long, so I better sign off there. But good work, guys. We'll talk to you later. David from Anderson, thank you for calling. Wow, he was ready to leave that voicemail. And I'm, yes. I'm glad that we finally got him we the hooked combos. Up. We got the, I, 
Was, first it was below deck. Now it's combos. We got to say something crazy in this episode so people <sighs> will be like, I have to call you about. Um, are you, what are you pulling? What are uh, you pulling? It's some sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah. How vanilla is the best scented yeah, candle? Yeah. <laughs> Fresh linen! Fresh linen. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't good. I was thinking of tires for some reason. I uh, think it was like Carolina squatting tires you and rims. Should, yeah, you spinners. shouldn't limit yourself, okay, Gavin? I know, I'm really learning not to, but it's difficult sometimes. I put these bumpers up and I say, why? Oh, why? God, 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 guys. Why? If you're a I'm therapist, sorry. <laughs> call in. Please call in. Uh, David, thank you for calling. I do think there is not much difference between eating pizza at a gas station <laughs> and eating a combo <laughs> At a gas Except station. Except convenience. Yeah. It's in the bite si- quotes, is bite size. Form. Everything's bite size if you're committed, okay? <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> I love this call. I love that you have now joined my sphere of eagles. Yeah, I influence. love that he says, I don't really care. Yes. Get That's that. exactly right. I, when you said, go birds, I was like, yes. But I don't And really then care. when you said, I don't really care, Gavin goes, yes. I was like, yes. Take so, a number. Uh, I mean, you're just, you're really doing it for both of us here. Um but I will say, even though you found those disgusting, mm, they're so good. I was peer pressured earlier Please. this week. There was so much pe- pressure. I was sweating. I was so nervous. Because Friend of the pod, Meg Kennard, was in our building. Correct. And she brought you a treat. She brought a treat just for me to torture me in a <laughs> in a fun way. You know, where she uh. she says. You're right. Pizza combos, they are disgusting. I disagree with that. That's why I brought you cheddar combos. Cheddar chatter. Cheddar combo. This is the cheddar chatter that we were talking about earlier. And I will, yeah, this is the cheddar chatter that we alluded to. Uh, and so here we are. We've reached the cheddar chatter. Cheddar chatter. And um, I will say, and uh, so I ate two of these, all right? Don't. And I will say, cheddar combos are better than pizza combos, but that is a very low bar. Mm-hmm. And because uh, they both contain dairy products. Solids. <laughs> Dairy product solids. Which we're still researching, but if you look at the ingredients. <laughs> yeah. um, if any science majors know <laughs> what that chemist, means, yes, please call These it. are modified dairy products uh, obtained by the removal of protein and or lactose and minerals from milk or whey. Oh, whey. Because no I'm whey. Because uh, I, was, I was pretty sure I'd never done any research, but just tasting it. Amazing. They taste so unnatural that I was sure Mm. they were probably vegan. You know what I mean? (laughs) Even though all of them are cheese related, Mm -hmm. I was pretty sure they were all vegan. And then when you look at the ingredient list on the back, Mm. there is the most intentional line break of your life. It says dairy product solids Solids. on the next line. Yes. And I was like, man, the heavy lifting on that line break right there. So, uh, I think it's terrible, but not as terrible. So, but, and then, well, we finished. We you had your one, yes. And then uh, Meg came back, hung in my office. We were snacking on the combos because we can eat them because we have that ability. Yeah, our bodies. You guys are just alphas with that grind set, <laughs> eating uh, tons of combos, and I'm not. Give me your salty snacks, and I'll just. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, because you're lactose intolerant, so did the daily, did the dairy solids have the, any effect? So no, I did the solids didn't. <laughs> Uh, so that, that 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 did but well there. But it's just such an easy snack food for the road trip set. So, Not the jet set, the road trip set. So is just a regular pretzel. Sure, but regular pretzels get boring after a while. You know what's I tired? Like... You know what's tired? Regular pretzels. You know what's wired? Combo pretzels. Combo bro. pretzels. God. <laughs> You are just not in the capitalistic snack food mindset. That I'm I not, to be in. and 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 just, then you tell me, and then you tell you have the yeah. gall to tell me I, earlier I, I before we even Gavin started. And I'm in a very fragile state on this Friday, folks. I'll yes, admit that is. to you. That you said, you know, I don't even like nachos. I don't like, I don't nachos. Even like nachos. I don't like nachos. Okay, that is that. That's tired. That's a tired take, right that there. That is from me growing up lactose intolerant. Oh, that's okay. So I never had those. The, like you know what I've also never eaten in my life mm. besides a nachos. And a Big Mac. I've never eaten a grilled cheese. <laughs> you make them all the time for Caitlin. Now you're I do. purposely not doing. I know. This. You're purposely I know not doing this. that I make a good grilled cheese. Yeah. But I've never eaten because. one because. Because I'm lactose intolerant. You pop a pill, you eat pizza all the time. Don't use that excuse. Pizza is different. That is a foundational thing in life. Oh, my okay? God. Okay? I never this is had a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. Sandwich. Have two if you're going to have to pop the pill. I, I just, I've never had one, and I've never had now the you, desire to eat one. Oh, my God. Now you're being just just contrarian to be contrarian. <laughs> anyway. Well, that's okay. People call in. 
Tell us your favorite Frank and please foods. save me for myself. Um, yeah, Gavin needs Gavin needs it. I need guys, support okay? here. Gavin needs it. Because even all. David was backing up AT. Yeah, I'm not saying that these Thank combos you. are like the best thing I've ever eaten. It's not foie gras, folks. I mean, come on. Foie gras. Foie gras. I'm gonna go ahead foie and tell gras. you, it's, it's foie gras. Foie gras. <laughs> are you talking about <laughs> foie gras? <laughs> Which I've never had. Uh, foie gras and hors d'oeuvres. But I do um, love some pate. I do love my tin fish. Foie gras. But that is not foie gras. Amazing. But that's. Oh, here we go. It's now amazing. we can talk about it's it. It's so good. Sear it. Whoa, so good. But Gavin, yeah, keep going. You're right. Gavin needs this. I can't, okay? I can't have my tin fish on the go, okay. right? That's just not conducive it, to campaign In, in your lifestyle? I, I, would, oh, I, would I just love, spilled all the juice I'd love to everywhere. be you on like a bus tour, Gavin on a bus tour, cracking open his tin fish, spilling his fish juices on, <laughs> on reporters I'm so all sorry. over. so sorry. I need my omega-3s. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to heat this up in the microwave. I'm really sorry, everyone. <laughs> you see the skin? You don't get it from just eating combos. <laughs> anyway, please call in Dave. David, thank you for joining my sphere of influence. Our Eagles are going to win next weekend, not this weekend, next weekend. Our Eagles. Our Stop Eagles, it. yes, Gavin included, Ew. David included. Okay, go birds. Uh, we're done, I guess. I we're guess done. So. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna talk about NPR voices, but we can leave. You're well, telling us we can leave. We can go. This is it. This is it, guys. Okay, have a good weekend. I love every last one of you. Kisses. Good night. Okay. Mm-hmm. Stop. Bye bye bye. What is this like outro that just keeps getting longer and longer every time? Just say goodbye to the people. I'm, I'm addicted. Be I'm like sick. David. Give us a shout. 803-563-7169. We need to hear from you. I need to hear from you. <laughs> You don't have to go buy the combos, but if you want to, we'd love to hear from you and your takes. 803-5669. You can also leave us your uh, appreciation, your love for us on Apple Podcasts. We need that. And you can stay up to date with the latest news on SCTV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. I think about it all the time. I don't because like, I don't have any dreams. We don't. <laughs> Is that recording? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta write that down. <laughs>